So what was the main uh, insight from Japan's story? Uh, they were really good at building products. Okay. The interesting part about Japan was, yeah, US was very good at doing the semiconductor wafers and Japan was at productization. You know, how do you create products like calculators and things like that. Uh, so one of the very interesting things which happened around that time frame was, as Moore's law suggested, right, is the, is the chip uh, production, how did it grow exponentially? The issue that uh, spoke, right, he was, he joined uh, uh, Fairchild Semiconductor and then he observed that, you know, they were able to produce the wafers, so many wafers, uh, but they couldn't build parts because it required, uh, you know, taking those chips, dicing them, and then they, you put it inside a plastic package, put wire bonds, all that stuff was very intricate, okay. So labor was extremely expensive in California and, you know, he was looking for a pool of labor. I mean, this is a very interesting story that even I didn't know when I was digging through the history, right. And I think you will also appreciate it, uh, what I'm trying to say here, right. So he was looking for a large uh, supply of labor to do all this stuff, right. And then he found out that women, okay, they have smaller hands by definition. At least at that time, I don't know about now, but at that time, the women's hands were smaller. Uh, so he said, oh, why not women? Let, let have women do this business, right? So then they had factories with lots of women doing uh, this very intricate work of wire bonding and all those things. Now, he also found out that, oh, the Asian women who are in, who are in California, they were even better because they had even smaller hands. So then he said, oh, so then let's hire Asian women in California to do build our parts. And then he said, oh, but then I still have to pay them California wages, right? So then he said, why don't we go to Asia and hire Asian women in Asia to do stuff over there. So we will produce the wafers in the area and then we will take them to Asia and then have them build the parts. Okay. And... Um, there he could give them lot lower wages. They were literally getting a cent on a dollar, like let's say a few cents on a dollar, like two orders of magnitude, right? Talk about dividing by GMR out. And they were willing to tolerate worse conditions, right? The very, very uh, sahenshil, that was the word. I couldn't translate that in, in English. Uh, so they were able to tolerate worse conditions. And that's where the offshoring that we like to call it was born. So offshoring happened because of this reason. So process the wafers in California and, you know, all the labor intensive tasks, you, you kind of, uh, you know, you move to Asia. Hmm? So here is a picture uh, that, that I like to show, you know, uh, of all the women working, right? Now, around this time, Vietnam War. Uh, we know that uh, Vietnam War was a, was a complete disaster, right? And in 1965, this particular bridge, which was on... Um, I think Sung Mi River in Vietnam and American forces were trying really hard to hit that. Uh, it was like an ego problem. Huh? They put in thousand bombs. None of them hit that particular bridge because that bridge was a link between the two sides and they wanted to hit it. So it's still standing after thousand bombs. So one of the military people, right, they were looking at this and said, this is a, you know, we are putting thousand bombs, not a single one is hitting the bridge, right? So, so then uh, basically uh, this person, uh, Weldon Ward, from TR. So he came up with the idea that can we make it like a laser guided bomb? And he came up with this idea, extremely simple and reliable concept because you can get overboard and you can start designing circuits with so many chips and things like that. And the more the number of chips or stuff is there, the more the chances of failure and specifically at such extreme conditions. So he came up with a very simple circuit, which had basically the bomb had fins which you could move. And so you would detect wherever the laser is and if the laser is moving to one side or the other, you move the fin accordingly. Feedback system, simple feedback system. So with that, uh, you know, this is the bomb. You can see the fins and that's, uh, you know, Weldon world. Uh, if you see there, right? Um, are you able to see the fins? And those fins move around hmm, according to this. And immediately when the bomb was dropped, the you know, first bomb, they were able to destroy the destroy the bridge with this pave away bomb. So Vietnam War, I don't want to get into the history, but United States kind of lost the war. Um, and you know, but even though they lost the war, they were able to use that as a playground, literally as a playground to try all sorts of ammunitions, all sorts of things which were getting cooked. They were trying it over there. 
uh, because uh, they they I mean this served as a kind of a uh, playground for combining electronics and explosives. Hmm? So all this stuff was happening, right? In in the because United States, as you know, is 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 a far away, and Vietnam is in one location. And mainly, what was going on? Why was uh, why were they bombing or getting involved in Vietnam? Because they didn't want countries to become communist. There was an influence in the neighboring region, uh, and there was an anti-communism, uh, you know, in United States in a big way, right? So as they lost the war. The surrounding countries were very worried. And who were the surrounding countries? Basically, Taiwan, South Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, all these countries, they were very worried. Are they going to right? They were riding on United States back, basically. They were hoping that United States would stay present there so that they can uh, they can maintain their anti-communist status. Okay. So South Asia. You know, all those countries, they basically wanted to integrate with United States future of jobs and investment uh, and, you know, focus somehow on getting American companies to build this stuff in South Asia. You know, following up from this outsourcing example, out offshoring example, they wanted to come, 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 you can put your companies here and you can benefit with few cents on a dollar uh, labor and all that stuff, but put your companies here. That was the thing. So the countries wanted, were welcoming uh, United States put their factories there with the understanding that if something happens to us, you better get involved. Huh? If if China does something or some other country does something, then you will be protecting us. And which is exactly what is going on right now. I don't know if you have uh, if you have observed the news lately last year, what was going on with Taiwan, right? Same thing. Taiwan is saying, you protect us. If you don't protect us, yeah, I mean, you will be, a, so everyone has, I like to call it skin in the game, huh? that's kind of thing. So um, uh, basically, that's what they were thinking, if there is a war, so they, they say that in 1960s, right, so the defense program, like all these missiles, were the ones which created Silicon Valley, because we wanted to move from vacuum tubes all the way to transistors, right? So that motivation was happening, all the expensive transistors were coming in because of defense. Interestingly, 1970s, this Silicon Valley, huh, which was doing offshoring to the to the Asian countries, right? It actually brought peace in South Asia. It's kind of an interesting way to look at things, right? So um, one other thing that uh, I want to bring out to you now, you know, scientists, right? Uh, Robert Dennard. Uh, so one of the motivations of giving this you know, history to you is you should appreciate all these uh, pioneers uh, who are already, who have done such a great work. So uh, Robert Dennard, what he did from IBM is, um, I mean, he was a, it's called eccentric genius. So he came up with a very simple idea. So earlier memory, okay, um, everybody knows what memory is, right? So memory was implemented using magnetic cores. So you would have coil and there would be something inside and by applying the voltages one way or the other, you would put a 1 or a 0. Okay, now you can imagine a magnetic core memory, it's going to be huge, right? So I have a picture for you here, so you can see um, that that's a magnetic memory and that's a big magnetic memory. This is 1, 0, 2, 4, 32 by 32, um, you know, circuit, almost like a PC board. Just for 1K of memory, you have such a big structure, right? So what, you know, Bob Denner did was he said that, okay, let's use just a capacitor on the chip, right? We, the chip technology was coming up. So just let's take a capacitance on the chip and charge it to either VDD or ground using one device. And that can be a memory, okay? But then he found out that, oh, the caps are leaky. So the, the voltage goes down. So then he said, oh, then I'll do it periodically. Over a period of time, I'll keep refreshing that the thing. And that's when the dynamic memory was born. Okay. So this is called DRAM. Hmm? All the, I mean, kind of the very first innovation that happened over there. And 1968 was a follow-up, new beginning. Bob Noyce, you know, Gordon Moore, uh, they founded a new company. And the name of the company was Integrated Electronics or Intel. Hmm? And uh, this is Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore. And uh, I think that's uh, Jones in the in the picture. Uh, she was uh, she was a temp. She joined them to help them as temp, but ended up staying for 27 years at Intel. Okay, so interesting story uh, in the Intel. So all the stuff that I'm collecting is from different different places. This is from the Intel Museum uh, that I'm telling you, right? So Andy Grove, you remember? 
um, from uh, you know Hungary. Uh, he left Hungary and went to US. Uh, you know, he did chemistry at Berkeley and then joined uh, Fairchild. And then he uh, also joined them afterwards. So it turns out that Bob Noyce and Gordon Moore were not happy with their stock options. Okay. So, and they also wanted some independence. And Fairchild was growing big. So they said, okay, all right, I'm out of here. Uh, Bob Noyce was doing lawn mowing. Gordon Moore came in. And this is a very interesting story uh, that they came up with this idea. And what was, what were they trying to do was they realized that DRAM is a killer product. Okay. So uh, their first product was a DRAM. You can see that there. And, um, and Intel was really good, even at that time, right, with all these uh, geniuses over there, is how do I take everything to mass production, okay? Once you have something ready, then make it mass production and get economies of scale, okay? That was the main thing that they did. And of course, mass production, economies of sale, the prices going down, margins were good, so they were making lots of money. So that was the first thing that the first product was DRAM and you know they really made a killing on DRAMs because nobody else was making memory and memory is important right when you uh, when you build things. So the next thing was uh, is a busy com company from Japan okay. So this company came to Intel Bob Noyce and said that hey I want to build a calculator using your chips. So they wanted 12 custom chips. Each chip was separate some architecture was different here and there uh, for a calculator right. So uh, Bob Noyce gave this problem to uh, Ted Hoff, he was at Intel and what he came up with was rather than designing 12 chips, why don't I design one chip? Imagine, I mean at that point there was nothing existed, right? Why don't I design one chip and I'll make it programmable? Very simple idea, correct? Other, what, otherwise people were just doing, ha, tujhe kya chahiye, ye chahiye. They, uh, you want this and everybody would be designing the chip and they would be going into production and giving it. But he said that this is too much work for the company. So here in this case, I will design one chip and then I'll make, I'll give you a way to load a software into this. Okay. So uh, basically DRAM was the one, you know, which was holding the software, which was necessary. And that's when the first microprocessor 4004 was born. Okay. So this is uh, Ted Hoff. Uh, so that you have an appreciation for our ancestors, as I like to call it, right? And this is that first chip, 4004. Uh, so, and you know, rest of the history we will touch up in, a, in the next class. And the reason I'm telling you this story is because where is India in this big picture? Uh, right now you're only listening to it from the newspapers. But slowly we will get into that and we'll have more fun. Thank you.